Hello, hello everyone and welcome to today's program, Automating Informed Consent, Moving from Paper to Electronic Consent Forms, presented by FormFast and hosted by PSQH. My name is Michelle Clark and I'm the Managing Editor at PSQH and I'll be your host for today's webcast. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. The first portion of the program is presentation followed by a question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review the web conference platform. First, to ensure that you can see all of the content for the event, please maximize your event window. Second, be sure to adjust your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Third, at the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the help widget which has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. We're very excited to offer this uh, free educational opportunity with FormFast and now I would like to introduce today's speakers. First, is Renee Martin, a partner at Dilworth Paxson LLP, and next is Yancey Stout, a project manager at FormFast. And finally, before we get started, a copy of today's presentation is available in the resource list wid widget, which is located in the lower left area of your screen. Please note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed using the same login link that you used for the live program. With that, I would now like to pass the program over to her. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to be discussing the legal elements of informed consent, um, the basis of the doctrine itself, um, the um, elements that should be included in, in the process of obtaining informed consent, and then review um, how informed consent can um, result in uh, malpractice actions uh, against mostly physicians, since as we'll find out as we go through the broadcast, um, that responsibility for obtaining informed consent still um, largely and principally lies with physicians. So I just want to go over informed consent um, and what it means um, generally. And believe it or not, the first time that the right to informed consent was recognized in the United States was in a Supreme Court case um, in 1771, um, authored by Justice Cordozo, who was one of the uh, esteemed uh, Supreme Court justices of the United States Supreme Court. And he noted in a case where a woman um, had not consented to have uh, and under anesthesia have a tumor removed from her uh, abdomen, um, she brought suit against the doctor and he said informed consent doctrine is based upon the principle that every human being of adult years and of sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done to his or her own body. So the doctrine of informed consent, as you can see, at least goes back to 1771 as being an important and um, basic uh, foundation upon which patient care is, is um, based upon. Um, it's based essentially on the patient's right to exercise control over his or her own body and to be able to decide intelligently for himself or herself whether to submit to a particular procedure. Informed consent requires a physician, and again, as I said, it still generally sits on um, the duty rests with the physician to disclose to the patient the information that will enable that patient to knowledgeably evaluate the nature of the treatment that is being proposed, what are the risks associated with it, as well as what are the alternative options and the risks and the benefits associated with those options, the likely outcomes of each, and um, all of that should be d discussed with the patient in a way that um, they can understand and comprehend um, before the patient is actually subjected to the actual course of treatment. So 
Um, why do we need um, informed consent and why is it required? Well, everyone has a right to be free from unwanted touching. Um, and this results when a physician performs a medical procedure without the patient's consent. And we'll see that that element of unwelcome or unwanted touching is one um, cause of action that can be brought um, under uh, a failure to obtain informed consent. The second important principle is that patients have the right to have autonomy um, to make decisions regarding their own bodies and their own health. Now, granted, there are certain situations that we'll touch upon briefly in the cases of a minor or if someone lacks um, the mental capacity to, to make those decisions for themselves. But as a general rule, the patient is autonomous, has the right to control um, the decisions regarding their own health and their own bodies. And they also have the right to make an informed refusal of treatment um, without physician liability for the resulting harm to the patient um, for that non-treatment. So it gets, cuts both ways. They have the ability to um, say they want the treatment, and if they're of sound mind, um, they have the right to say they do not want the treatment. Um, so why is informed consent required? Well, first of all, because I'm sure we're all aware there's a special relationship that develops between the physician and the patient. And the patient um, places this duty on the physician um, that they will be kept informed of the risks and the alternatives of their, uh, of their care and their treatment. So whenever a patient comes to see a physician or even a nurse or a physical therapist, um, once that patient and practitioner relationship develops, then under a negligence theory or under a malpractice theory, that's the basis upon which any um, cause of action in negligence or malpractice would emanate from. So negligence in the informed consent framework, that's, uh, it, that's the framework that's used in the majority of states. Um, Negligence uh, means that the patient needs to prove that there was a duty, which we've discussed already, between the provider, in this case the physician, and the patient, that there was a breach of that duty, that the breach of the duty was a direct, direct cause of actual physical patient harm that resulted in compensable damages. So under the negligence theory, the physician has a duty to the patient to keep the patient informed of the risks and the alternatives that are available for each significant medical procedure. So unless the plaintiff, in a, if they're going to ground their theory against the physician in negligence, can prove all four of those elements, they haven't proven that the physician has been negligent. Now, there are two legal standards that have evolved over time, considering um, what does the patient want to hear about and what does the physician believe that he or she must inform the patient of. So there are two legal standards as one revolves around the patient. One is the patient need to know standard. And in some states, informed consent um, is what an individual would reasonably need to know to make an intelligent decision about the procedure that's being um, proposed to them. Now, whenever you hear the word reasonable um, in a legal context, that really means you're looking at an objective standard that the average person on the jury would agree with. It is not what that individual has as a subjective standard. It's an objective standard that everyone can pretty much agree upon. Um, so it's an objective standard that means someone on the jury, someone from the outside um, looking into the discussion between the physician and the patient would say, um, this is what I would want to know if I was in that individual's position. Um, keep in mind, though, that in most cases, um, doctors ordinarily are not required to give a detailed medical explanation that in all probability the patient you know, would not understand. So no matter what we're talking about, I think we all understand that um, what the patient needs to know or would want to know would be um, 
um, the types of general information that the average person would need to know to make an informed decision. The other standard that is used in other states looks at the informed consent um, that a physician believes or a reasonable medical uh, practitioner believes would be, um, would be responsible for providing to the patient under the same or similar circumstances. So it's again, it's an objective standard. Um, what would a physician, let's say a um, cardiac surgeon, be expected to inform a patient who's going to undergo um, cardiac bypass surgery? What would they need to know about that procedure? But what would a physician, a cardiac thoracic surgeon, um, from an objective standard, um, be required to tell the patient? And it's an objective standard, so that means um, it has to be something that is not subjective to the physician, him or herself. And this generally requires the use of an expert witness because the expert witness then would be called upon to testify in a negligence action um, regarding whether or not that physician in that particular informed consent process um, met that objective standard. Now, the other theory that can be used um, to um, bring a cause of action in uh, against a physician for a lack of informed consent is that in medical battery. And battery means um, several things. First of all, an unwanted touching. Um, so we've all heard about battery, assault and battery being used in, in the criminal context. But the basis of uh, medical battery is sort of the same thing. It arises from that same context historically where the patient is being touched in a way that they have not consented to. Um, the plaintiff has to establish either that they were un unaware that the doctor was going to perform the procedure and they didn't consent to it, or that the patient did not um, authorize the actual procedure that was being done. For example, in the medical battery where the patient did not ex, uh, consent to exactly what was done or agreed upon between them and the physician, is there was a case where, a dental case, where a patient thought that he was going to only have a couple of teeth pulled while he was under um, uh, anesthesia, and the physician actually pulled all of his teeth and um, the patient had all those extractions done and then had to be hospitalized thereafter. So he was able to bring a cause of action against the physician for battery because the physician went beyond what he and the patient um, had discussed as what was going to be the course and the scope of the actual procedure. Um, the second time that informed consent can be um, result in a battery is if the patient did not authorize the procedure itself. This is a case where the doctor performs a surgery um, that has been discussed, but uh, the surgery is actually performed on the wrong body part. They amputate the wrong limb. Um, surgery um, extends beyond the field um, that the patient has agreed upon. Um, for example, and this is similar to the um, individual who had all the teeth extracted instead of the several teeth, um, let's say and there have been cases where women have gone in for um, hysterectomies, and during the course of the hysterectomy, the doctor or the surgeon believes, well, I'm in here, I'll do a nephorectomy at the same time. And I think in this day and age, we can see that that would be um, something that would be uh, Kind of egregious, but in the past, um, physicians um, I think were a little bit more lenient and um, were paternalistic about how they um, treated um, patients and had more of a um, mindset that they knew what was best for the patient. Now, the important thing to realize is the two cases that I've shown you here um, resulted in some kind of harm to the patient, um, loss of. Uh, reproductive capability, and then with the guy with his teeth out, um, he had to be hospitalized. But let's say the physician um, does a procedure, it extends beyond that which the um, 
doctor said they were going to do. And a common case of this is when a surgeon will go in and do something on the colon, and while they're in there, they'll do an appendectomy. Well, um, having the appendectomy performed by the physician didn't actually cause any harm, but perhaps that wasn't discussed between the surgeon and the patient before the um, on the informed consent and during the conformed consent process. And there have been cases where um, plaintiffs have sued because of that. Um, actually, they don't get too far because I think the average person on the jury, the, the damages are very limited. Um, so the patient wasn't doesn't need to actually show harm. And the other thing, why, and the other reason why this is chosen as a cause of action rather than bringing one under negligence is that you don't need expert testimony to establish the fact that the physician went beyond um, the scope of the surgery that he or she had discussed with the patient prior to the surgery. Okay. Um, so in order for um, negligence to be the cause of action to recover, um, sort of a re reiteration of what we described a little bit before, um, but this is in more detail about actually what the duty of informed consent means um, in a negligence malpractice action and specifically. Number one, the physician has a duty to disclose information including the material risks and alternative treatments, including non-treatment to the patient. They have a duty to disclose what a reasonable patient would consider material. Okay, so this goes to the standard that most states use that you are looking at a reasonable physician um, standard and expert testimony would be um, brought to bear at the trial um, to show what a reasonable patient would be expected to hear. Um, you have to be able to show the physician did not disclose required information, that the failure to disclose the required information caused damage or injury to the patient, and then the patient suffered some kind of harm or injury as a result, as a direct result of the breach of complying with what was requisite information the patient needed in order for there to be um, an adequate and fully informed consent. So sometimes all you need to show with a patient is emotional distress, and that may be enough to um, have a claim for negligence under the negligent informed consent theory. Um, overwhelmingly, um, it remains the physician's duty um, to and to be responsible for obtaining informed consent. There are some nuances now that we have, um, you know, other healthcare practitioners and allied healthcare practitioners um, providing certain services, but most of these allied health professionals, um, physicians assistants and nurse practitioners or nurse midwives, they either function collaboratively or they function um, under the supervision of a physician. Um, so it's still the ultimate responsibility still rests with the physician themselves. Um, in fact, as in point of fact in the Pennsylvania, um, it's expressly stated in the statute um, regarding the physician's supervision of the uh, physician assistant that um, it's the strict liability of the physician for anything that is done or not done by the physician's assistant um, that um, could result in patient harm. Um, also in Pennsylvania, and I'm just using this as an example since so this is where I largely practice, um, one of the things that came out of our state's um, attempt to reduce malpractice exposure for physicians was that um, the state holders got together, the plaintiff's bar, the defense bar, insurance companies, et cetera, and they actually statutorily um, dictated um, what needs to be um, included in an informed consent uh, discussion and when informed consent is necessary. Um, so not all states do that, but uh, you, you should check your, your um, statutes and your codes in your own state if you're subject to them to see what the informed consent um, elements are and if they're codified at all. Um, 
Keep in mind also that the document, um, and I'm sure that um, Yancy will talk about this even further, but that document is nothing more than a document, that ev the informed consent form, that shows that the discussion took place. And as a defense malpractice attorney, which is what I did when I first graduated law school, I can tell you that that consent form can easily be um, disregarded or um, yeah, disregarded by plaintiff counsel is just saying, well, that's just what the paper says, but that's not what the, the patient is saying they were informed about. Um, so informed consent, generally the physician still has to provide it. Um, there may be statutes within your own state that lists um, who else can obtain informed consent, but one of the most important things and questions that I frequently get from nurses who um, are afraid to sign on the uh, witness line on an informed consent form. The only thing the nurse is, is witnessing is the patient signing the document. They are not signing the informed consent uh, form to indicate what, in, in any manner whatsoever what was discussed between the physician and the patient, nor to give any um, attestation that the adequate, that the informed consent process was adequate. The sole purpose of the witnessing of the, um, on the consent form is to demonstrate that the um, patient signed the form. Um, Okay, two other concepts, some concepts I'd like to um, discuss and move on to, and I sort of alluded to them at the beginning, are, um, you know, who can give consent and um, when, when can an individual not give consent? And involved in this are, are two separate concepts. First one is competency, and the second one is capacity. And we'll talk about capacity first. Capacity means you're able to consent to medical procedures um, and it's determined by the criteria of informed consent. So what does the patient have the ability to do? Can they understand the medical procedures, specifically understand a description of the procedures, its risks, its benefits, its alternatives? Can he or she give consent? Are they competent? meaning does he or she have a guardian, and that's when that we have to look at whether or not they have um, competency to do that. Are they able to reasonably understand the condition that's to be treated, the effect of the proposed treatment, the risks, the benefits in treatment and non-treatment? Is the patient um, unable to understand the consequences of their decision, then that patient is unable to give informed consent, and is therefore um, lacks capacity. So therefore, you would turn to then their personal representative or perhaps a legal guardian that has um, been appointed on their behalf. Now, in many, many cases, um, the family members or um, the individual that is having the surgery has not gone to the point of uh, having a judicial determination that they lack capacity to make their own medical decisions. And that's why it's so important to understand um, and establish as early on as possible when you first have um, interaction with the patient, who's their personal representative and who, who do they want to make, if, luckily if for you if they have an advanced directive, but who will make decisions for them. And keep in mind that minors lack capacity to consent under most state law unless they're an emancipated minor. In some states, you have to um, file for that in an actual court of law. Or in other states, you become um, emancipated because you've gotten married, you've graduated high school, you have been pregnant at one time. Um, but generally, um, there's an age um, in each state that says when you are legally capable to make your own decisions um, to consent to surgery or to buy a car or to do any of those things. And so you'd have to look in your own state to see um, what that age is. Now, competency is a legal finding. Um, 
competency proceedings, like I said, include guardianships and or conservatorship hearings, and they are conducted in a court of law, um, and the individual has a representative um, that says that they lack competency to make decisions for themselves, and um, they go before the judge, and the judge um, makes that determination. Now, incompetency is the lack or the ability to discharge or understand either health care decisions or financial management decisions, and sometimes you'll see a power of attorney um, that says the person's incompetent um, either to make health care decisions or to make financial decisions, and most of the times you'll see one that is combined um, with both, and that's the same thing as if you see an advanced directive sometimes or a durable power of attorney. Um, you have to look at it and see whether or not it's for a health health care decisions or financial decisions um, or both. And then if the court finds that the individual lacks competency, then they will appoint someone else um, to be able to make decisions for them. Um, in order to get a guardianship, usually the standard is pretty high because I think, as you can see, um, from the case law that dates back to 1771, that there's a very strong belief um, that the individual lacks, lack, excuse me, has capacity to make his or her own decisions, absent a really good proof that they're incapable of doing so. Um, they can't take care of themselves. They can't take care of their own necessities. They can't um, get their own food or shelter. And they're generally sort of um, not able to care for themselves and, and unsafe um, for them to take care of themselves. And they really need someone else to um, assume those responsibilities for them. Now, so that's who can give consent, who's responsible for giving consent, what are the legal theories that can be brought against a physician who is predominantly still responsible for obtaining the consent, um, so we've covered that. So now let's look at what are some of the elements of the informed consent. Um, well, first of all, basically you have the physician has to describe um, what the procedure is. And again, there's a, a balance here that has to be um, achieved between giving sufficient information so that the patient understands what's going on giving information in a manner in which the patient can comprehend what they are being told, and then um, making sure that you're not giving so much information that you're inundating the patient. And I know, unfortunately, this doesn't happen in practice, but many times the patient might need, you know, several question and answer periods with the physician as I digest the material and um, have additional questions for the um, for the physician. But, you know, it's pretty fast-paced in, in this world that we live in these days. You know, gone are the days when I was in nursing school when the patient was admitted the night before, they were given a sedative, you know, they were they were um, set to wash and shower with their betadine scrub, et cetera, while they're in the hospital. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. The informed consent, you know, is sometimes signed in the physician's office. And the next last, next time the patient sees the physician, they're in the um, waiting area to go in to have um, surgery, and um, they might even already have gotten their pre-op medication. Um, so you want to make sure the patient understands the risks if the procedure is not performed, the benefits if the procedure is performed, what are the potential complications, the usual ones and the rare ones, and generally most patients want to hear, well, what's the percentage of the um, likelihood of a rare complication occurring. Again, alternate treatments and risks and benefits of each alternative, and then what are the residual effects going to be from the surgery? What's the expected um, recovery time? And this is what the average person um, generally would like to um, understand and to know about the procedure that they're going to be engaged in um, or have performed on them. And that's the information that most physicians, I think, um, provide to patients um, in various um, depths or in, um, in tends to one the amount of time they actually spend with the patient. Um, because I said the consent form in and of itself 
is only there to document that the conversation took place, any good risk manager would tell a physician that it's also good to document um, specific areas of concern or of um, interest to the patient in the progress note also, so that it's another way for the physician to, um, if the patient is going to bring an action in negligence, to actually show what was discussed and what was um, emphasized during the co course of obtaining that patient's um, informed consent. So what are the problems with obtaining informed consent? And what's the um, problem with the form itself? Um, well, most procedures and treatment plans are really highly complex and they're difficult to understand and it's hard to get that all down on a piece of paper. Um, providers really are not always able to invest the proper amount of time in the face-to-face -face time that's required to translate all of the aspects of the procedure. Um, it, it really anymore with physicians being rushed um, in the office visits, um, it, it's darn and fast, quick and fast, and um, there's insufficient time, and they've done studies on this, and I'm sure we'll continue to do this as time goes on, but you know, just as with any patient education, um, you want to hear them recite back to you what they've just heard, and that frequently is something that is um, not no times allotted for that. Um, also, if any educational materials, videos, and those kinds of things can be provided, that would also be a help because, as I said, the form in and of itself does not get the, the job done. Um, the other problem with the form is that um, it's, Frequently, that timely patient um, signatures are not obtained, and um, I have already been um, involved as a risk manager um, in a hospital, and you know, even though we have pre-op checklists and you think that it, the patient wouldn't get to the OR being under anesthesia before someone um, realizes that the consent form has not been signed, but I have had, had had multiple instances of the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, you know, running to my office, um, letting me know that um, the patient's under and they haven't signed the consent form. And the only real way to tackle that is to let the patient lighten up enough from anesthesia so that they can go ahead and sign the form. Um, even though they might be under the effects of anesthesia, the idea is the discussion and the informed consent was actually obtained before the patient got to the OR table, and based upon that rationale, it's okay to have the patient sign the form at that time. Um, there's also a lack of consistency in completing the forms. Um, missing in consent forms are always a, are frequently a problem. Um, patient signatures may be illegible, and actually the uh, PAQH actually did a study that examined the completeness of 540 consent forms from about 157 hospitals and nationwide, and of these, only 26.4% included all four of the basic elements of informed consent, the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, and the nature of the procedure, 87% noted the general possibility of a risk, but less than half provided any specific information on what the more uh, fine-tuned and um, expected and or rare expected side effects could be from the um, operation or procedure being performed. Um, alternatives to the um, procedure were only listed in 56.9% of the forms, and the benefits of having the procedure appeared in only about 37% of those um, forms, and both of them were just general references and no real specific information being provided. So the risk of paper-informed consent um, really um, has shortcomings for patient safety in two ways. Number one, um, wrong, so wrong site, wrong body part, even though, you know, JACO has, during commission, has the, the uh, patient marking the site that's to be operated on. Unfortunately, mistakes were still um, made. Um, the quality of the care risks are not um, frequently provided to the patient. 
um, the selection of in the inappropriate therapies, or as that's not mentioned as a risk. Um, there's increased patient anxiety. Perhaps they're not really listening to adequately what's being um, said to them. And then poor compliance with um, poor um, post-operative procedures. So the automated informed consent forms um, can actually create a centralized um, controlled repository for procedure-specific forms. Um, and you know, I'm sure Yancey will uh, address this in more detail, but it actually does improve patient information management. It reduces the risk of litigation because patients are much less likely to sue if their patients communicate effectively to them. Uh, it reduces transcription errors and staff time that's required for transcription. It actually improves reimbursement. Um, it reduces delays in the operating room due to lost paperwork. Um, as I said, preoperative checklists are often very insufficient tools. And it achieves a heightened compliance with accreditation and regulatory agencies. It allows the consent for the procedure to be done by one provider in one facility, and it can mirror the consent forms for identical procedures prepared in sister facilities. So let's say you have an ambulatory surgery center and you have an operating center, and the consent can be the same across the healthcare system, so everybody is familiar with it. Um, it ensures the entire document is legible. It allows um, for risks to be uniformly included, so it's not left to the individual physician or surgeon to include them in there. But yet it does provide some flexibility to customize the form for that patient's specific needs. Um, providers can access treatment information and answer patient questions about the surgical site, location, the diagnosis, or enter case-specific considerations described between the patient and the physician, the anesthesia, et cetera. Um, it also allows a progress note detailing the informed consent to be um, also um, simultaneously automatically posted to the patient's chart. Um, it allows for the form to be easily translated into different languages, and we all know that um, cultural competency is um, an issue that um, CMS looks at for um, their conditions of participation of hospitals, of skilled nursing facilities, and even of ambulatory surgical centers. And it, all of that um, eases and allows more time for discussions. Um, the significance of all of this is not just patient safety and good physician-patient relationships and um, that patients are not harmed and they're kept safe, but it also goes towards um, accreditation standards because the Joint Commission specifies that an institution has to have an established policy for informed consent. It has to determine what procedures require informed consent, establish the process for collecting informed consent, and then they have to specify the hospital or the facility has to specify how that consent is going to be documented. So the automated automated consent form does all that. Um, the other thing that people might not be aware of is that the um, state operations manual, which the state surveyors use for CMS, um, has expanded the definition of informed consent. Um, has given explicit detail concerning um, what the form is to contain, what the description of the procedure has to be listed in there, um, the risks, the benefits, et cetera. So it has consequences for the patient, for the physician, and certainly for the um, facility. So based upon that, I am going to pass this on to Yancy and let her um, begin her portion of the presentation. Thank you, Renee. That was an excellent presentation, um, and, and I think that gave us a great idea of the uh, all the legal aspects and the what should be on that form, form contents. Uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on uh, a few numbers, uh, a few of the logistical uh, challenges that occur in the process. So as, as Renee mentioned, the uh, conversation is so important between the physician and the patient. But 
in addition to that, there is a whole process that works around all of that that um, makes everything happen. And from obtaining the form to then all the way to the form actually being available to the care team. So um, I do want to, to be brief so we can, there's some excellent questions out there and I want to I want to try to get some of those answered because um, that's really good stuff and, uh, and Renee can provide some good answers to that. But um, first, a quick look, and uh, Renee mentioned some great numbers with the form content. Also, uh, this is a study uh, done on missing documents. So um, documents, consent forms that never made it to the system uh, and couldn't be located afterwards. We can very disconcerting, but I mean, pretty big numbers for uh, to consider. You know, what may be happening at your facilities? Uh, is this a, an issue, a legal concern uh, that, as a risk manager or a director of nursing, I really need to consider? And how can I make this better? So, as I mentioned the process, everything is, is workflow. So how does this all fit together? Um, you have to obtain uh, the form initially, and if the life cycle of preprint is very hard to manage and make sure that all the forms and all the different units and departments are fully updated. So you have the concern that a clinician may grab a form that is not up to date and not approved. It's an out of date form. And that could, um, could cause some serious issues down the line when that form gets pulled back and, uh, is needed for legal purposes. Once that form is obtained, then in a pre-printed form situation, on paper, a label has to be applied to that with patient information to make sure it's indexed and archived in the, uh, with that patient record in the right place. Often that, that doesn't happen uh, exactly how we planned it because there's a human element to that. We add the potential for human error. Uh, so with an electronic process, it takes away a lot of that human error, prevents problems and potential problems. Uh, the availability of the completed form with the patient record for the rest of the care team. Renee touched on this, and this is, uh, this is a serious issue in talking with lots of healthcare organizations where um, not only does it take the time of the OR staff and uh, nursing staff and physicians to keep looking for that or search that form out, um, but it, it causes delays and it can cause cancellations. And that, that causes everybody um, time as well as, as there's a financial cost to that. And so the immediate availability of the consent forms is really crucial. Uh, and then as far as uh, exposure to liability and compliance issues, I think Renee covered this beautifully. Uh, really, an electronic form process ensures uh, that the forms are completed the way that they should be. Uh, there's no changes or backdating happening so the integrity of the form is is um, kept and then uh, the form is always there it's always available because there was no human element to make sure that the form was picked up from the folder on the unit made it all the way to um, HIM perhaps where it was to be scanned and then was scanned and indexed and archived in the right place there's a lot of uh, room for error there. So this kind of process can make that better. Really quick, just think about the uh, your process and reflect on what your process looks like today. So if your facility is having some of these uh, issues or considering some of these uh, aspects, then you may have a really amazing opportunity to improve that process, um, protect 
your patients, as well as your physicians, nurses, and organizations, and make their experience significantly better. Uh, certainly, there is a to uh, to do things in an electronic manner. Informed consent has kind of lagged in the in the push to to make that electronic. I think organizations are realizing that that's the next area they need to focus. So just briefly, I'd like to go through, um, if you're considering switching to an electronic and pulled consent process, what are the requirements you should be looking for? What are some of the things you could should consider? You know, what capabilities are important? So first, as far as the actual forms management, and, and Renee really made this point with the central repository of forms um, that makes consistency and accessibility uh, so much better. So you want a solution that's going to provide a, a way for you to scale that. If you have uh, more than 10 forms, uh, if you're doing a form per procedure, which is, is uh, very common with healthcare organizations, you may have 200 forms. Well, you need a solution that's going to provide the, the capability for you to create those forms in an electronic format quickly and easily and revise them when necessary. Because as, as Renee noted, the content is so important. Even though that's not the conversation, the right content does need to be on the form to help that conversation move along. And it should, re it should eliminate or reduce, certainly, the cost of pre-printed forms that you're paying, storage of those forms. There's a lot of uh, different implications and positive benefits you can have from uh, getting away from that paper. And then as far as, as the informed consent process at the bedside and the conversation that happens, the electronic form can help in many ways that Renee mentioned. Uh, certainly, we've found uh, in, in studying this that, that readability of the form, you can make it larger uh, with an electronic device or paper. You don't really have that option. So if, uh, if the patient really is a visual person and wants to review and read all of that information, we want to make that as legible as we can for them. And then we want to make it more convenient for your staff. Again, as I mentioned, making the, the patient and clinician experience better is a key driver of why you would change your process. Make it more convenient, save them time, and give them a little peace of mind that they know immediately when they push that button, the form is in the right place, and the care team has accessibility to that. So as far as uh, looking at, at the benefits, we've talked a lot about this. And this slide just really recaps all the different benefits that the, the process can provide. Um, over in the, uh, the resources, you'll see a link to learn more about um, mobile best I can send with, with electronic process. And you um, please, uh, click on that link and, and you can learn more. Um, we're going to have some questions in a minute. Hopefully we can get, get additional answers there. But the, the benefits are, um, you know, what, what we need to focus on. But really it, it's more about you reflecting on your process and figuring out what, what parts of the process do you want to really resolve? Where are the trouble spots for your organization? And make sure that whatever solution that you select um, meets those needs as effectively as, as you need it to. As far as uh, signature collection, there is uh, certainly an importance to compatibility across hardware platforms. And, uh, you know, whatever you, hardware platform 
tablets, uh, mobile devices that your organization is using, make sure that's in your consideration. Uh, if you're already, if your physicians are already using mobile devices, that needs to be part of the consideration, the requirement that the software solution that's going to pair with them is going to work beautifully. Obviously, it's got to be um, able to collect multiple signatures and collect them in an eloquent fashion. So, um, and, and really be able to uh, provide that experience for base, both the patients and the clinicians. And then the right forms for the patient. So this is really important talking about patient safety. So here, when the, um, we, for medication and many of the services that we're providing patients in an on, inpatient, uh, situation, we're checking and confirming their barcode before anything is administered. This forms should apply as well. So electronic information is going to be pulled onto that form, and it needs to be the right electronic information. So a barcode scanning application can certainly provide that insurance that it's the right patient. Instant archival for increased visibility. So this is, this is the final piece. So the rest of your care team and your OR team um, and, and everyone that's supporting that procedure that's going to be performed or that um, whatever that consent form is for needs to be able to access the signed consent form to verify the right body part, what's been authorized, and, and that it's been signed by all the appropriate people before uh, the person is preferably before they're put under anesthesia, but um, certainly before any, any more care is provided. So I'm going to pass it over to Michelle for a, a, a set question and answer period. And uh, hopefully this, is, this has provided some benefit to you. So Michelle, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Renee and Yancey. This brings us to the Q&A portion of the program, so we would now like to invite you to ask live questions of our speakers. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. Please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. So our first question, and I think this one is for Renee, is do you have to provide a patient with a copy of the signed consent? Um. I don't know if it's customary, but yes, you would have to provide a copy of them if they um, requested it. That would actually be part of the HIPAA requirement. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Yancy, this one might be for you. Um, does, how does this technology integrate with our, EH, with our EHR? Absolutely, so that's a great question. The, uh, there's several different ways that we can actually integrate. We can create links out of your EHR uh, and on the front end. So when you're on the patient record, then we can create links into, um, into the form. Uh, and we can also, uh, based on HL7 messages, uh, ORM order messages, we can receive those and uh, generate forms for patients in that way that again a link could uh could navigate you over we also have an interface that you can access forms on demand so if you're walking around the unit and um and on the tablet device that's not necessarily going to be directly from your ehr but you may have a few consent forms to fill out you can log into our software very easily and pull the forms that you need for the patients that you you need um, them for. And on the back end, so we uh, seamlessly integrate with uh, your most of the major content management systems that stores all of those images that are then available within um, the EHR on that patient record. So once you hit submit, um, based on the information that's already been pulled into that form, it indexes that image 
appropriately with the patient record in real time. And so the rest of the care team access to the EHR just as they normally would, and the document will be there uh, in the images. Great, thank you. Uh, Renee, this is another question for you. Actually, this is a very popular question. Uh, we've had several people ask if a witness to the signature is always required uh, for the consent form. No, and um, I, think just, I think there's no legal requirement for the witness. That goes back, I think, to the um, witnessing of a will, <laughs> and um, I think it just harkens back to an earlier time than a custom that has just been perpetuated um, until present day. But no, I, technically, it doesn't even really need to be witnessed. It's just a policy Great, and procedure thanks. to follow if it's part of your institution. Okay. Uh, another question is, are completed forms, I'm so sorry, I looked at the wrong question. I apologize. I, I skipped ahead. Um, is informed consent necessary for low-risk office procedures such as joint injections? Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I say that because um, whenever you are touching a patient and doing something to the patient, certainly injecting a joint is touching a patient, and it also involves a procedure. So it does require some form of uh, informed consent. You know, what would be the expectations of the, the benefits of having the injection? What would be the um, benefits of not having the injection? What are the expected results? What are the expected or unexpected complications? All of those things, I think, um, are warranted whenever you are um, injecting um, a joint or something like that. Obviously, an in intramuscular injection, that, that's a horse of a different color. Um, you know, you'll say, this might hurt a little bit. I'm going to inject it into your, in, this goes into your muscle, et cetera. So I think, but anytime you're going to touch a patient and inject them um, with a sharp object, it's probably a good idea to get some form of uh, consent from the patient. Great, thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. The next question we have is, are completed forms sent back to the EHR as a PDF? And what HL7 mechanism is, is used for that? Typically, uh, we're actually using cold feed. Uh, but uh, certainly in, in some circumstances, we have sent an HL7 message to, uh, to archive that back to the EHR. It really depends on the system that you're on and how we, we decide to configure it that's going to work best for you. Um, we can do it either way. Um, but uh, we, we typically don't do PDF. And uh, so again, we can talk about the, the needs there. Uh, most often, we found that uh, TIFFs work really well for archiving uh, to document management systems across the board. But again, we would just need to, um, to discuss your needs as, as an organization and, and what you want to happen and see how we can meet those. Great, thank you so much. So unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. Um, in closing, we want you to know that your feedback is very important to us. And at the conclusion of the program, a link for the evaluation will appear in the slide window. And it can also be found in the program evaluation widget at the bottom of your screen. We would greatly appreciate your thoughts on our program today. Uh, for further information uh, and resources on this topic, please visit, uh, you'll see the URL on, on your screen. Uh, if you could just click right there, it'll take you right to, the, to more information. Um, at this time, I would like to thank our speakers again for joining us today and sharing their knowledge on this topic. And to our listeners, thank you all for putting aside so much valuable time to listen to our program. We hope you found it informative. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day.